Stuart, you're very welcome to the ScaleX Insider podcast. Really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, you're very, very welcome. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So, you know, our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So to kick off the, the show and the conversation today, Stuart, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? Yeah, well, well to me, it, it actually means it, having some kind of meaning uh as to you know why you've uh, you've decided to set up a business or work for business and uh and uh and it's it's not just about sort of making money and then thinking about hey what are you going to do with that money in terms of philanthropy it's it's actually you know I, I think we've got used to this model where you you know you go to work you take a salary business does what business does and then over here there's lots of opportunity for charity uh, and I think that if business was operating the way the business should operate with the right kind of purpose, then there wouldn't be such a need for all these kind of charities over here. Uh, and so it's really bringing the, the right kind of thinking into what we do in business so that we can we can inspire our stakeholders, you know, the kind of people who are responsible for driving value for us in a business context um, to um, to have that kind of extra energy that we all want to see within business. Uh, and because because you know they come into work every day and they're doing something that they know is delivering some kind of positive benefit and as a result of that of course you then get more productivity and and then you get on the other side of purpose you get improved economic performance uh, but it, it puts purpose as your primary motivation uh, and it puts the economic performance as a consequence the secondary motivation a consequence of of um of getting up every day to to deliver some kind of positive purpose brilliant i really really love that uh the the performance is essentially the score for uh executing on a on a meaningful purpose and you have certainly done that in anthesis and i was I, th I thought that name was quite unusual, so I googled it this morning, and it's the flowering after the bud opens, which is just just beautiful. I think I've got that right, but you guys have scaled rapidly since 2013, since you founded the company. Can you give the listeners a sense of your own purpose, why this company exists, and also I'm curious to understand if you can take us through kind of the history of your scaling journey and and some of the inflection points on that scaling journey so we can kind of dig into some of the challenges that you've had to overcome. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, actually, I take it back to um, uh, to the mid-1980s when I, um, my first year of my degree uh, and uh, at what is now called Oxford Brooks University, uh, and I did environmental biology. And I always remember the first uh, the first day, the first lecture, the head of the faculty came in and said, hey, if you want a job associated with the subject of your degree, you need to change courses now because there are no jobs in this subject. Uh, and um, uh, but for whatever reason, I thought, well, I'm interested in this. And uh, so I'm going to I'm going to stick with it. And so uh, so that's what I did. And then and then uh, I think in that same year, 1985 uh, was the first time that uh, I learned about climate science. Uh, and just as a reminder, I mean, actually, the climate science and the understanding of climate science uh, dated back to significantly before 1985. But sometimes we 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 think this is some kind of recent re revelation. Uh, but but actually, there's a lot of people talking about it. And Margaret Thatcher even gave a, a keynote speech at the United Nations the day after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. Uh, you know, saying you know the climate science is real. The world needs to decarbonize uh and um and and i think that that um you know when you realize the the existence of this climate crisis that we are in then it becomes a bit of an epiphany moment moment now some of us you know had that moment in the mid 1980s and some of us are still to have that moment but uh but for me at that point i thought well probably at some point in my likely lifetime, there is going to be the biggest transformational change that humanity has ever had to embrace. 
Uh, and uh, I didn't know whether that would be 1990 or 2000 or, you know, the reality is it's, it's probably pivoted about three to four years ago. So I've had to wait quite a long time. Uh, but uh, but from that point, I thought, well, actually, you know, the, the world's going to need a lot of help. So why don't we try to assemble the kind of expertise that needs that help? Now, of course, you can't, in business, you can't ignore markets. So you've got to go to where the market is. Uh, and in the 1990s, the market was very much driven by cleaning up the legacy of the past. So there was recognition that actually, you know, businesses had been um, uh, polluting the environment, whether it was air, land, water for many, many decades. And and they were able to do that without any any penalty. So there was no cost associated with, with pollution. So then we saw this legislation coming in around sort of polluter pays and that kind of thing, and that stimulated a market. So we we moved into that market and we very much cleaning up the legacy of the past. And then the market moved in the next decade to sort of helping organisations do the right thing today. So it was really sort of putting in place the right kind of policies and the permits and the licences and that kind of thing to tighten up on things. But the but as we we always knew that actually the um, the main topic that we should be addressing which is preparing ourselves to an increasingly uncertain future related to the climate crisis was still being neglected um, by markets by business by governments and so uh so we we learned a huge amount from you know 1990 which is when i really started in business um through to 2010 we learned a lot about business uh, we were starting to do more work around sustainability, which was getting us more excited. But it was really in um, 2012 that we thought, actually, um, you know, we are just finding ourselves now in a place of frustration where, you know, we, we are seeing so much talk about the climate crisis, so much talk about sustainability, such little action and where there is action there is a very high failure rate and and we we felt passionately that actually doing business the right way embracing sustainability decarbonizing should be a source of value creation and we were seeing it as being a source of value destruction typically in the context of business uh and we thought hey we've got to do something about that so so that's that's when we we myself and various other people i knew from from uh, our world said hey let's let's do something new let's get a blank sheet of paper and with a blank sheet of paper and perhaps we can piece together an organization that we we feel is is the right organization to be able to help companies navigate what will well it still wasn't with us in 2012 but will become the the, the biggest transformational change that humanity's ever had to embrace and, and so that's 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 what we did so i to answer your question to answer your question sorry very long-winded way of getting but let's bring you to the start of this journey so yeah. you know you've arrived at a point where you've you have discerned a, a huge problem to solve yeah. in the world and in the words of marga hoik uh business for good is good for business so you've 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 you know you've reached a point with your co-founder and other and other um stakeholders in this problem uh people who have a desire to solve this problem uh to to found a business Take us on that scaling journey because this is a significant business. You've now what almost nine hundred people across Europe, the Americas. Um, uh, so it's a significant business that you have actually scaled in the last ten years by actually, if I go to our the the uh, the seventh principle of our scale X framework by really delving deep into a proposition and bringing value to people but it stems from and is anchored in a strong purpose and vision so give us a sense of the give us a sense of the kind of starting out what was your vision uh when you started 10 years ago and and take us on that that scaling journey kind of mapping out some of the some of the inflection points for you yeah yeah sure um so uh so to start with i think that you know our, our our vision was we wanted to make sustainability happen we wanted to be able to prove that sustainability can be a source of value creation 
so that was that was the uh that was the platform and we also were getting frustrated by seeing that the the market was being failed by um specialist consultancies uh and and what we were seeing was that uh increasingly were that the uh the the models that we were operating in and our clients were operating in were broken and they were trying to deliver success within those broken models uh and um and those broken models look like business as usual and actually what was happening is, is the organizations were chucking a bit of money at their csr departments and they were saying give us some good news stories so that if we are challenged we can wheel you out we can wheel out these stories uh and the problem can go away and we can get back to business as usual yeah this is but, really important uh yeah. Stuart sorry to interject no, 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 a no. lot of a lot of um people will level it will levy at me you know the the the, the fact that I uh, look this is all virtue signaling it's greenwashing uh you know uh, that quick let's let's find a purpose because this is what uh this is what uh, you know consumers and stakeholders are are looking for but back to your point it's really business as usual so actually you know you're dressing up really uh what was already there so so what what were you guys uh and what do you guys do differently because if you think of our leader our, our listenership their smes they're you know the the general thought is well this is this is for the preserve of big companies who yeah. are the major polluters anyway and it's the preserve of governments we're just trying to make payroll next friday you know yeah. i don't even really understand what sustainability is in the context of my own business so actually yeah. just picking up on that for the lay person out there what is sustainability and and what is what what is the approach that you guys take uh, and how have you kind of evolved in your scaling journey as a result of really uh really bringing that to the world yeah sure uh, and there's you'll have to steer me through the answer here because it, yeah it's, it's a big question there's two things going on here well, there's one uh, us as a business and then there's and then there's what we do and, and the impact that that's going to have typically on on smes but uh but as, as a business you know we started out like so many of your listeners you know we were we were bootstrapping and um and struggling to meet payroll and we we actually decided uh, from the outset that uh we, we wanted a we, we had a big ambition uh but we had a limited amount of capital um to uh to get things going and we knew that we had some contacts and we had some networks and and but we knew that if we went to a client in silicon valley they would say that's great that you're here on the west coast of america but actually we need you in our supply chains in asia or we need you in our markets in europe so we we knew that we had to deliver some kind of big bang so so for the um for the year between myself and leaving, leaving my previous job and getting our thesis going we were really lining up the dominoes and trying to get finance and we uh we went out to uh to investors and venture capitalists and private equity and all of them said no uh so in the end we decided to finance it ourselves doing what you do we mortgage in your house and investing in savings and and um and having some tough discussions with your families because you're you're putting not just yourself at risk but also your families at risk and and um and we we raised two million pounds and that was enough for us within um the space of um four months to have um hired a team in america a team in china a team in philippines to have bought a business in the uk uh and to bought a small business in germany and when we put all that together we were losing two hundred thousand pounds a month um and let so me, you know, with let, too many pounds obviously you can burn through that pretty quickly sorry yeah no i th this is and here's the first inflection point uh the our very first principle on our 10 principle scale x framework is psyche you had to have 
absolute belief in what you were doing to have those difficult conversations at home and to encourage the others around you to have those difficult conversations. Uh, it would have been very easy, I suspect, at that stage to say, you know what, you know, you've already had a wonderful career. Uh, you could walk into another job in the morning to actually go back to the comfort zone. What was it that that pushed you through that, Stuart. I'm no doubt there were restless nights when you're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Let's just take, you know, a, a job in the in the city, take home a nice salary and have a lot less difficult conversations here. What was it that propelled you through? Uh, so it was, uh, it was and it was an excitement about the business opportunity. Uh, so uh, I think it would be wrong for me to say that, um, you know, our excitement was all around the purpose. You know, I, I don't really like segregating business opportunity from purpose because the two are completely intertwined as far as I'm concerned. You know, I get I get really excited by how uh, business is is probably the most powerful and agile institution to be able to deliver change so i believe in business uh and um and this was we felt an incredible business opportunity uh there were a number of people that felt the same way and wanted to pursue the same mission i was in an advantageous position i was a i was a director at footsie 250 company I, I was able to be able to take the time uh to be able to set this up but i i felt that um that i i wanted to do something because it wasn't just me there was the um you know the opportunity to pull together an incredible team an incredible team to, from the outset uh with a uh a a a a a common vision a unity of purpose and that seemed to be a special opportunity and i think that we had a it's a now or never moment. Uh, we were of a particular age and we thought, well, if, you know, if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. Uh, this is our moment. And, uh, and if we don't do it now, we'll always look back. Uh, I'm not great. I'm not a fan of looking back with regret. So I hope I wouldn't have done that, but we would all, we'll always look back and, and wondered whether, you know, we had used the platform of business understanding our reputation in, our, in the market our expertise our all that kind of thing whether we had actually used all of that gifting to good effect do you remember a pivotal moment whenever you know you were all around a table and maybe you were kind of 97 percent committed uh but you kind of everybody high-fived or whatever or embraced or and you said okay we're we're all in here we're 100 percent committed was there was there a point was there a moment uh um, yeah that's a great question i'm not uh, i think the honest answer is I'm, I'm i'm not sure there was there was just lots of um i mean i i suppose partly because of uh, an issue of proximity you know uh some of the founding members were in america and somewhere in china and 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 that was one of the beautiful things about it actually that it, it was this sort of borderless you know it doesn't matter where these people were everybody was united behind the same vision they could they could see the same um uh they could see the same benefits that we could we could bring to the market uh and and so there was just lots of late night early morning conversations uh with people sort of saying where are we at you know, uh, it, because because we're trying to piece this this thing together. Within the first four months, you know, we we've gone to about a hundred people, and so then you're then you're off and running uh, with all the kind of sort of excitement, uh, uh, and that you know it's, it's a it's a white knuckle. I mean, many of your listeners will know when you set up a business, there is a white knuckle phase, and uh, and you know if you don't if you don't make it through, if we if we if we uh, we raise too many pounds if we were burning two two hundred thousand pounds a month for too long then we're out of business within six to twelve months you know uh, and um, so that and that that creates an amazing um, sense of relational trust because you're totally dependent upon each other and and I think the other th the difference with us was we said hey the only way we've got we can raise the capital we need to get going and to deliver the vision so the vision for us uh, I, and I I'm, I'm in lots of sort of CEO networks 
And it always amazes me how m many times I ask the question of CEO, you know, what's your what's your aspiration, what's your purpose? And they say, uh, well, to, um, to retain as much of the equity as we can uh, and to to create as much value as you can within that equity and then to exit. Uh, and and to, and to have the bragging rights about, you know, fantastic multiple, you know, and, and you talk to them six months, 12 months afterwards and they, and they, uh, and they, they, they wouldn't use these words, but, um, uh, but their experience has been much more typically has been much more hollow than they thought it would be. Uh, unless they know what they're going to do with the money they're taking from that exit, and and they're and they're really excited about it because that's got purpose, you know. Yeah. You know that, that but but typically it's much more hollow. There's two <laughs> things that strike me here, just to, uh, mm. and we haven't. Uh, uh, apologies because I, I I love this and and I and I I love digging into this, mm. especially the the power of purpose and vision, and also what you've introduced here, which is almost the. Uh, the catalyst of a burning platform where you're kind of burning through this cash, you've got to make it happen. I'm not sure if you're aware, I think Jordan Peterson mentioned it in one of his lectures, the uh, the test they did with, with mice to test ambition and desire levels and they essentially they strap a little uh, spring coil to the the mouse's tail and they put the mouse in a tube and the the spring is a proxy for desire and they waft the smell of cheese into the top of the tube and they the mouse will you know move towards the cheese and you'll get a sense of how how ambitious it is how desired it is to reach the cheese it doesn't, but when they waft in uh, the smell of a cat at the back of the tube, the mouse <laughs> just <laughs> propels itself forward towards the cheese. So it's interesting. What I'm hearing here is a is a combination of the cheese, which is the the vision, uh, you know, that that excitement around kind of creating a, a bringing this wonderful proposition to the world, but also the cat in the context of your own burning platform which you'd created you you taken in th this money and you were burning through it quickly does that resonate yeah, yeah it does but i think yeah absolutely uh, but i think it's i think it's different for different people because i I'm, uh, we actually had a a bit of a sort of um anniversary reunion uh, uh, a few months ago and um and i was saying to some of my fellow founders uh uh i said wasn't that first six to twelve months amazing you know the adrenaline was pumping it was so exciting we just like, we're just alive you know and some of them said Stuart we hated it, <laughs> hated it. <laughs> you have no idea how much we hated it uh, and and um uh and I said well, how, how can you hate it and it just made me realize that that actually you know uh everybody's different and um some people get really excited by this ride and other people you know, get uh, get excited uh, about what well, different they or they, they they just want a different level of comfort. So that sort of that sort of um, the inspiration of the cheese versus the 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 fear of the cat. Everybody's somewhere on that spectrum, but they're they're in different places on that spectrum. <laughs> this is my yeah, no, I, and that's a great insight. I think you know, if the smell of the cat's too uh, too strong, uh, we we then just close down. It's back to kind of fight, uh, yeah, flight, yeah. or freeze. And for many people, they just freeze. So mm -hmm. uh, we're conscious that we're just at the start of this scaling journey. But uh, you have me excited with that that initial stage of 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 creating creating the vision anchored in a really strong purpose. Uh, with the excitement of doing something that is truly game changing. Uh, you're burning through a lot of cash. Uh, you've pieced together a number of businesses. Uh, so take us, take us on this journey, uh, this 10 year journey and, and, some, and, and draw out some of the key inflection points then, uh, Stuart, if you would. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we, you know, so the first thing we did is we, we looked at where, where the market failure is. Why, why is it so broken? Why, why, uh, why are companies not delivering success? in sustainability and we we identified things I won't, I won't go into detail but it was you know companies were operating in silos and they weren't joined up geographically and for sustainability to be a success you've got to take it from sourcing supply chain manufacturing point of sale end of life and so so you've got to look at things in a different kind of way um 
and and also looking at sustainability in very solid ways so carbon isolation of water isolation of waste biodiversity it's all interlinked so there were there were lots of things that we sort of criteria identified and we said okay so this new organization we need to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes and so therefore why are we going to be different so so it's about being clear about your differentiated proposition that you're going to be able to bring to the market and ensure that that narrative is clear to the kind of clients that you want to attract so so that was that was very much part of the start. And then, and then when we conclude that, we thought actually, if we're going to stitch together these different bits, you know, we we likened it to the market was being given a jigsaw puzzle with the wrong picture on the lid or no picture on the lid, and then the wrong piece of the jigsaw in the box, and then sort of like you know go and make something useful out of that. And of course, it was doomed to failure. And so we said, okay, well, we need to have the kind of people who can engage with the C-suite. And, and to identify what is the destination, what is the right picture, and it's going to be different for every client, what is the right picture, and then we've got to bring the right areas of expertise, the deep subject matter expertise rooted in science into the different pieces of the jigsaw so we can put, put them into the box. And that, that took us on a buy and build because we, we thought we don't have the patience to just organically grow that business. So we uh, we wanted each piece of the biz- the, the jigsaw we did we did hire some of these in but typically we acquired businesses um that then allowed us to piece things together in a different kind of way so again we were you know we were bootstrapping so we got we got the business from making a loss it took us a couple of years uh but we took it into profit we raised more money over that um at that time because because either our employees that were coming on board and investing in the business as they were coming in or some high net worth that we knew, you know, believed in what we were doing. So we were able to continue to raise the capital. Uh, and and it did take us to a place where we were acquiring businesses that were great businesses, really good brands, great clients, good people, but commercially were not operating in an optimal way. So we were able to negotiate deals with them and structure deals in such a way that um, that allowed us to be able to bring these companies in. Uh, and that took us to about um, that took us to about five hundred people. And that was we're now up to about two and a half years ago uh and uh operating in a number of different countries and then we brought in private equity uh a small um uk um small medium sized uk uh based private equity firm uh who um who acquired 40 percent uh and and that that turbocharged the growth of the business and the 60 percent was still owned by the employees uh and um and then uh about six months ago we came to the conclusion that actually we had become you know we we were then about a thousand people uh and we had outgrown that investment partner notwithstanding the success of it uh and we needed to find a bigger investment partner that had more access to capital that had a bigger international footprint that could really support us in the next phase of growth so uh so we just um completed a deal with um carlisle who are one of the biggest private equity companies in the world uh and um uh and they've now taken a very significant stake within the business uh and so you know it, it has been quite a journey i have to say from that sort of uh, the white knuckle startup phase 10 years ago now where all these private equity companies small and large well we didn't actually go to large so small uh all said no now to seeing the appetite um of the biggest private equity companies in the world for a company like Anthesis. It's it's an incredible story. We've referenced buy and builds here before. I reference people back to some of the, the conversations I had with Nick Bradley, for example, in some of the earlier seasons. Um uh we went through a master class of, of buying and building and uh as I understand, you've now acquired 16 companies over the course of the, the 10 years. Worth actually giving a shout out to the, the other PE firm, uh, the, 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 the guys who have just been bought out. Who was that, Stuart? That was Palatine. Palatine. Man- Manchester based. Right. Uh, okay. Also, also in London, but Manchester based private equity firm called Palatine. Okay. Yeah. There's there's a whole other conversation podcast to be had just on the process 
of successfully acquiring businesses in itself uh, to acquire 16 businesses to piece all of those together is is some feat the fact that actually you've gone from being a you know small founder led business being bootstrapped to a medium sized business to now a large business where the governance i suspect is very different from going back to 2013 how has that been for for you and some of the other the other founding members were you know in those early stages you're very much in control you can make decisions at the weekend and you know you're off and running on a monday now i suspect board you know board board meetings for all major strategic decisions how have you adjusted to that and and any any insight you can share uh, with our listeners in in how you've had to change yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that's um, how I've had to change. Sounds like it's in the sort of past tense, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I, just on your point of um, integration, uh, because I think that this sort of carries through, uh, is that we've actually borrowed a phrase from uh, the bishop of spoleto who i think lived in the sixth century in italy um which uh and his phrase is um is is in the essentials unity in the non-essentials understanding in all things uh uh something like kindness and fairness we use kindness and fairness i think he used the word charity um but the meaning of that's kind of surprise. and the the um the uh, and when we're buying a company they say what's the process of integration and we use that phrase uh and we do that because we believe that you have to unite behind certain things you know unless you're going to be a complete dis disaggregated sort of organization uh and so we say in the essential unity and the essentials are vision values purpose strategy and brand okay there is no there's no real negotiation there's a discussion because our our vision values purpose strategy and brand evolve all the time and we want the businesses coming in to help with that evolution and contribute to it uh, but we can't we can't operate with lots of different brands you know we can't we can't we can't operate if we've got a different sort of north star um being our purpose so we have to unite that but but what i see with so many integrations so many integrations go wrong especially in people businesses is that they try to create amorphous masses right they try to structure everything so in the non-essentials they also try to create um uh, 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 they, they try to hom homogeneity if you like for want of a better word where whereas we have to recognize there's so much diversity you know you try to make your business in barcelona look the same as your business in shanghai in san francisco etc there is wonderful diversity in businesses and, and in our world yes we work for big global clients so we need consistency across those global value chains <clears throat> but sustainability is landing in the local it's got to be delivered through local cultures and through local languages and so you've got to respect those local identities so so that is that is that that's where we need to understand rather than try to ram everything into some kind of amorphous mass so that's that's just a point i want to make on the the what, what is sort of bounding principle of the way we integrate and that carries on through the different sort of investment partners that we've got that's really profound and it resonates strongly as we in my previous business we went from a small medium to large established offices in six continents and exported to more than 100 countries and we actually had a strategy called the localization at one point where you know it was taking what we had the core of what we had but actually localizing it meeting people where they were at meeting certainly our consumers or customers where they were at and yeah. um uh, what would you consider just uh, for clarity's sake you know what are what are some of the non-essentials the things that you didn't focus a lot of time at uh, are on yeah uh, well i mean so when it comes to um salary grading structures 
uh, when it comes to you know uh, the the mar- the market for talent is going to be different in different parts of the world. Uh, we do. We certainly need uh, common ERPs, so common systems that can really sort of connect up the organisation and, and allow the flow of knowledge um, and um, and access to the kind of expertise and the assets to to happen really efficiently. So we definitely need that. So we've got that kind of platform. But um, but I need I need the the leader of our Spanish business, for example, or our German business or our American business to be able to. Um, connect to the macro culture of the business and to draw those values down into the culture that needs to be created for a Spanish business or an American business or a Chinese business and so on. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, that's, that's the sort of, I don't, I don't want somebody in Spain being judgmental over somebody in America just for the sake of them doing something different because there may be good reasons for them doing something different. Um, and we need the maturity as an organization to recognize that actually people in America get paid more than people in the UK. Just the way it is, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and, and there, there are, there are different ways, there are different ways of operating within different cultures to be able to get the optimal output. And, and if you're an impact led business, a purpose led business, then you pull everything back to, you know, when you've got these kind of disputes going on, you say to them, okay, well, what, what's the right answer for impact? What's the right answer? Uh, and, and often that reunites people um, and typically gets you to the right answer, as opposed to people getting all sort of flustered about this sort of, perceived aspects of unfairness that uh, that might exist within the business because you've got so much diversity and of course a level of complexity within the business it's such a wonderful insight you know and uh, again resonates strongly with this you know when things start to get noisy uh, within the business uh, bring people back to to why this business exists in the first place you know anchor back to the purpose and mm. get everyone reunited towards the the vision that you've created uh, I that that's so insightful. You guys are a B Corp. Uh, we haven't discussed B Corps on on the show before. I'm I'm curious. Can you can you uh, share with our listeners what a B Corp is? And I'd love to tease out the advantages of the B Corp as as you see it, Stuart. Yeah, sure. Uh, and um, for us, we we wanted to we we asked ourselves the question. So, well, you know. We're making all these claims in terms of of you know our role in society and our role in the climate crisis and our own so uh and um but we need some kind of independent uh validation uh and there's all sorts of places you can go for independent validation of these kind of things uh some are credible some we don't think are particularly credible but but we um we felt that the the one that represented the highest bar that would be most meaningful for for us and for our stakeholders was uh, to become a, a B Corp, and uh, and so for for us and and different people use different aspects of B Corp, but but we um, we we changed our articles of association, so there was a legal commitment for us uh, to have a responsibility and a fiduciary duty to all our stakeholders and not just to the shareholders. Uh, and, um, and incidentally, we do believe that the shareholders will do better if you look after all your stakeholders. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that's, that's, that's what we did. And then we have to report upon our performance and there's some pretty strict guidelines. Uh, and you know, I know that there's some concerns out there that it's a bit of a club, you know, and uh, and I've I've recently had some some um, communication directed towards me that you know you're either in the club or you're not in the club, and if you're not in the club, then does that mean you get cancelled when it comes to sustainability? Not at all, not at all. You know, there's there there are some fantastically well performing businesses that are not B corps um, that are very purpose driven. But um, but we found that it it 
it has meant a lot to our employees, probably more. I underestimated how much it would mean for our employees. I, I thought that for our employees, it would be enough for them just to say, hey, we work for our thesis, you know. Um, but uh, but actually, um, you know, a lot of them like to say they work for Beacon. Tell, uh, tell me more about that. Yeah. Uh, be, because I think that it, it, um, it also validates them on their journeys because we talk a lot and so we come onto these you know, kind of sort of forums and we talk about the corporate journey we're on, but we, we need to remember that a lot of businesses and we're not just a consultancy business. We, you know, we do a lot of advising work. We've got a lot of people work for us, but we've got digital solutions. We've got other assets that we develop, but, but we're still very reliant on the people, the talent that work for us. And, uh, and we mustn't forget that they're also on their own journeys. They are vocational, purpose-driven individuals that want to feel that the organisation they devote so much energy and commitment to uh, is um, is committed to doing the right thing. Uh, and and B Corp validates that and validates them. Yeah, B Corp provides the the badge that you're actually walking your talk in many respects. And mm. what would you say to? to SME leaders out there who are hearing this uh, this concept of becoming a B Corp for the for the very first time you know is it is it rigorous in terms of application and does it still mean that you're uh, you know you're leading the business with the aim of maximizing the return for shareholders so again to avoid any confusion this isn't for charities this isn't for not for profits this is for uh, profit driven uh, limited liability businesses is that is that correct Stuart? right yeah absolutely and there, and there are some big companies now like nespresso who are um uh who are b corp and are doing some amazing things yeah um and so it's it's a, it, but it is fair to say that most of the organizations within the b corp community would be smes and just in terms of the the rigor of the the application process and the yeah. ongoing compliance can you yeah. can you speak to that yeah yeah um yeah i mean it's, it's quite a lot of work it typically takes a year um from you know deciding you want to become a b corp to actually become a b corp uh and you've got to go through the whole process is uh the part of b corp is simple b labs and you 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 have quite a iteration with uh, with them in terms of getting you to um the right place and and it's it's a high bar uh and um and you get over the threshold so there's a particular threshold in terms of school where you can become b corp and then you need to report upon a part of that of course is commitment to continued improvement because no company out there is perfect no b corp is imperfect um but um but they get above a threshold and then there's a commitment to ongoing improvement so you need to then report back on that and in regular intervals uh and um so you know there is a there's a there's a cost of entry which is predominantly associated with investment in time uh and um uh and so you've got to weigh up the kind of benefits you're going to get against against that cost you yeah. know for a company like us it's very purpose driven it's a it's a bit of a no-brainer to be honest but so for other companies will be more of consideration and at a time when employee disengagement is at an all-time high certainly cited in recent gallup studies as much as 80 mm. percent uh, what what you're saying is that or certainly what i'm hearing is that uh, having the b corp status certainly drives engagement drives retention um i'm making uh, the assumption put it to you i'm assuming it also will drive uh those candidates who are passive uh, who will now actually be attracted into your company as a result of the b corp status uh, what other what other benefits of b corp have you seen do your customers value it certainly i can imagine in your industry they do and i would expect it but uh, do you you know what what are some of the other benefits yeah, look, uh, I mean, in terms of value creation, you know, we, you need to, we need to look at sustainability as being a, not, not something that's at the periphery. It's, it's at the core of what is going to be driving business now and, and in the future. So it's about, it's about market share. So, you know, cons consumers are starting to, uh, and there's quite a lot of evidence around this now, are starting to make value based decisions in terms of the, their buying habits uh so 
you know, if you can demonstrate that you are a B Corp, uh, if you can demonstrate that you've embraced sustainability in a meaningful way, not in a greenwashing way, in a meaningful way within your organisation, then then there's a lot of evidence that, that, you know, that not with every business, but with a lot of businesses, especially consumer facing businesses, is going to help you with market share. <clears throat> there is um, there is lots of evidence, especially at the moment with the cost of energy as it's been over the last couple of years, to show that bracing sustain sustainability will get you more operational efficiency. <clears throat> will get you more resilient supply chains uh, and will enhance your brand value and and various other things as well. But I, if I just pick on those, then for most businesses, they are typical sort of drivers of value. <clears throat> and sustainability is absolutely aligned with those business drivers. So, and, and B Corp allows you to really sort of focus on that and think about, well, how am I crystallizing the value of sustainability in my business to make best effect of those? Now, a lot of SMEs, of course, are not consumer based in their B2B. Um, and, um, and what, um, what we also need to recognize is the arrival of regulation, uh, and legislation. So, you know, uh, even if you don't buy into sustainability being, associated with um uh driving value creating value you're really not going to have any choice going forward because regulation will require all businesses large and small to change what they do and to actually require all businesses to do what is currently required by b corp so by that i mean so for example if i look at all the talk around net zero and decarbonization and all the commitments have been made typically by big businesses what hasn't been realized by a lot of SMEs at the moment is that that the the old model was is that you had your sort of corporate stronghold and supply chain was outside that it was an externality right so so therefore it became much easier to be able to then use your leverage as a corporate at that in that relationship with your suppliers and indeed with your customers to create as much value as you possibly could within that corporate stronghold to then support your shareholders in a shareholder first model right to be able to decarbonize and to meet net zero there is a requirement for organizations to get their arms around the full value chain including all their suppliers you've got to take all your suppliers with you so net zero commitments requires you to to tell all your suppliers the tens of thousands of suppliers that you may have that they have got to meet the same standards because you've got to take them all with you and you've got to hold those suppliers to account. Now that is going to lead to a very different relationship within supply chains and the kind of relationship the SMEs have got. So SMEs need to be able to respond because an SME with a better carbon performance is going to represent value in a B2B relationship they've got with larger companies on the food chain. Yeah. So this is a lovely segue into your your wonderful book. Uh, I had planned to to dive into this earlier, but I'm just intrigued with your own scaling journey. So the adventure of sustainable performance beyond ESG compliance to leadership in the new era. For those listening, you won't be able to see me holding that up. Uh, I would encourage you all to grab a copy if you're if you're keen to dig into sustainability and all things sustainability and and a practical application of all things sustainability sustainability into into your business some of the criticism that certainly levied at the united nations 17 sustainable development goals for example and and the un general is that this is just uh this is just a a kind of a uh, a, a Trojan horse for more regulation, more compliance in companies, and and ultimately this is where some of the resistance is coming to. You know, you have these terms like CSR and ESG, and you know already for ESM, SMEs the compliance level at a at, from a government perspective is is significant. Um, you you couch this differently because you know ultimately this is. This is coming down the track, but if you frame it in a different way, and you have, uh, you have a, a really nice quote. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna quote you from your book. You've a, you state this really nicely in terms of and quite starkly. We have assumed that we can deploy infinite models for growth and prosperity in a linear model, whilst on a foundation of finite resources. 
The reality is we can't do what we've always done in terms of continuing to to produce more what, with a, a finite level of resources. Can can you can you explore that a little bit further and share with our listeners what you mean by that, Stuart? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so the, your average British person needs three planets to support their average lifestyle. Um, the average American would be more than that. Um, the average Chinese person needs one planet. Uh, and um, so, but but overall, we're all heading towards lifestyles uh, that are ignoring our planetary boundaries, uh, using models and systems that um uh that require us to have access to infinite resources when we know that we have one planet with finite resources so that in itself is just by definition that is unsustainable um but we do also believe that our planet offers an incredible amount of abundance but we don't have the models and systems to access that abundance uh and so the book really explores how um, we can move into models and systems that are by definition sustainable uh, and can look after future generations uh, and um, uh, but also how you can continue to get prosperity within that model uh, by having models and systems that allow us to access the full abundance of planet earth so there's a slightly different narrative you know it's a sort of uh you know the the narrative in the past has typically been growth and unsustainable or um or non-growth sustainable uh and we think that there's another model out there it's 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 a bit like uh, and we're not suggesting that some of these other sort of economic models are are um not relevant because they might be relevant for the crisis it's it's a bit like it's a bit like um arguing about furlough and lockdown in the pandemic you know okay the um uh the covid crisis was a, a was a pretty significant crisis that we've just been through but actually it goes into significance compared to the climate crisis but we needed an emergency response uh and uh, that emergency response for most countries looked something like furlough and lockdown uh and so there may need to be an emergency response within the climate crisis but nobody's arguing that furlough and lockdown is the right model for the long term it was a uh, the right model for the crisis and we needed to move through the crisis and get on the other side of the crisis so that we could move into a model that was more sustainable now the problem with the pandemic is we've just gone back to the previous model what we're talking about with sustainability in the climate crisis is we have to find a new model we call sustainable performance uh and um and uh, and that requires leaders and uh, and organizations to recognize that the existing models that they're operating in are broken and that they can't continue to create fantasy zones around greenwashing or or wheeling out the CSR department or all the kind of things you just mentioned uh, in your intro to this question to convince their stakeholders that everything's okay just to buy them another three years or to shore up their pension pot or whatever because there is now the big stick of compliance and this is a different form of compliance it's not the incremental nudges and improvements that we've seen typically with regulation over the last 20 30 years this is forcing people out of those places and saying you know if you don't come out of these places then you won't pass your audit you know um you know it's as simple as that uh and you know the the risks are so high now associated with not stepping into this transition out of these places of perceived safety the broken models of the old era into this transition zone that that people are going to be forced into that, that place the book really is is trying to frame that day one you know into the transition zone into some kind of future day two which is on the other side of the crisis 
Yeah, and you frame this beautifully by way of uh, a story of your yourself, your wife, your family visiting visiting Africa and being charged by an elephant, and then kind of day two being the reapproach rather than being fearful of that e uh, elephant. It's actually just approaching it in a different way. And again, I encourage people to to grab a copy of the book just to just to kind of bring that together. There's a number of things here. And again, I want to amplify the point that, you know, those companies who have sustainability at the heart of their purpose are actually, and the research is showing this, more profitable. They're outperforming their peers by three times and they're grabbing more market share is what we're seeing. Uh, I, I, the, the other, the other, so it's, this isn't a case of kind of the, uh, being profitable and sustainable are mutually exclusive. They're not. What we're saying, actually, in, in the day two, in the new world, uh, in order to exist, survive, and be profitable, actually, you must put sustainability at the heart of your uh, your purpose. How would you, a couple of things before we kind of wrap up. There's a, I'd like you just to de define sustainable performance for the lay person out there. And secondly, the you have highlighted the fact that we need a sense of awareness that this isn't going away this problem this challenge this global crisis is not disappearing the business community has a wonderful opportunity to actually make a huge difference but the reality is you whether you do or don't, that's the road we're going. So rather than resist it, what's the mental lens by which leaders should actually view the, their business now and the, uh, the challenge come opportunity out there? Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my answer to that question could take us down different paths because I, I could, I could, um, I could go down the path of, uh moral and ethical leadership that we are in a decisive decade and what happens over the next well what happens in this decade will determine what happens over thousands of years uh and so we are at this extraordinary pivot point in history where um uh you know we are the the first generation of leaders really to have all the facts at our fingertips. And I think I'm probably quoting something along the lines of what David Appleman said a few years ago. Um, you know, the, to have all the sort of facts available to us and we are the last generation to be able to do anything about it. So so it, it, it's, there, there is this incredible sort of weight of responsibility. Um, but but there's also, I think, um, and, I, and I, I tell this to my kids because it really upsets me to see that the... the um, the low levels of hope within the next generation uh, that actually for most of my career I've had to operate find a way of succeeding within those broken models it's not that they've suddenly broken uh, that they've actually been broken for for decades um, and notwithstanding the fact that actually they have delivered extraordinary economic prosperity so we should not ignore that there have been great benefits associated with the economic models and systems that were designed after the second world war but nevertheless it's been increasingly clear over the last 80, 80 years that they're unsustainable and they are broken but we now have the opportunity to redesign to reimagine what those systems and models should look like for the next era learn from my mistakes and get it more right take the good stuff because there's lots of great assets in the old era that need to be stewarded and to allow some of the stuff that's broken to be stranded uh, and and uh and uh for me it's it's uh it's you know incumbent upon business um business has got a responsibility because it moves so fast it moves so it moves much faster than um governments and government's got a role to play by creating the right the right environment for business but businesses are are, are the are the are the powerful institutions out there that have got the opportunity to really influence the way society moves just coming to to our close and before we before we get into that what would what appeal would you make to or what 
practical guidance would you offer to our listeners say yeah i hear you there's been a you know a lot discussed in 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 this podcast acronyms thrown out there esg csr b corp you know these concepts and uh, you know that all that all sounds great how do we ensure that those listening don't kind of stop listening to this podcast and go back to business as usual what What's the minimum viable action they can take as a result of listening to this podcast that is practical and reorientates them uh, down this path? I, I think to, to look at sustainability through, through a different lens, um, to to really start to think that, that, you know, on the one hand, you've got this big stick, you are going to have to move. So there's no option. You have to get ready for the regulation. You have got to get, whether you're in B2C or B2B, you've got to recognize that you are going to have to move. So there is, there is a, there's a preparation and, and a, a readiness requirement uh, associated with just where we're at at this moment in history. Um, and so to, to, to get yourself into a place where you can actually move through all of that new regulation in an efficient way rather than as we we've, we've stated in the book with the vivid metaphor being paralyzed in the charge of the elephant because there'll be lots of companies out there that are just paralyzed uh and um and we've used the term pivot or per perish you know companies have got to get ready to pivot because if they don't they will perish um and um uh, but to quickly move beyond that to think actually you know, this this isn't just, you know, a cost of compliance thing where we're going to cut a check and go back to business as usual. That is not going to happen. So therefore, we have got to operate, first of all, within the transition zone and within that transition zone, start to reimagine what sustainable performance looks like. Sustainable performance, for us, you asked a question earlier on, is really about creating <clears throat> value at the same speed as we're extracting value in a, in a very simple form. Uh, and... Um, and at the moment, we are extracting value much, much faster than we can create it uh, in the existing models and systems. So, and it's more than that. If you read the book, you understand it's more than that. But, but nevertheless, that's a sort of simple sort of way of of, um, of, of landing this conversation. And it, and it's how can we create value in a different way? So, you know, I would get employees, whether they're shouting about it at work or not, they care about this kind of stuff. Get them together. Get them together, get that sort of wealth of, uh, of, of excitement and understanding and, and get their ideas as to the kind of improvements that could be made. Start to get the marketing team in terms of talking to your customers as to, you know, what is, what is driving your customers and what do your customers want from you around the sustainability agenda. Start to think about how that can feed into your brand. Uh, and, um, and, and start to just engage with it and start to be excited by it rather than thinking, you know, it's just, just, uh, just another, another thing, another thing that, you know, you're going to have to embrace, um, uh, that, um, that is going to, I know so many companies see it as bureaucracy and, and that kind of thing. And we've got to sort of move beyond that into, to something that people can get excited about. Anything else you want to to mention before we move into a close? Anything that we we haven't covered off today that you feel uh, is really important? Um, <laughs> that's a big question, uh, <laughs> uh, and and, it, and and I think that I think it's uh, I I I think that we we've covered probably what what I. I that, uh, the, the reason why we decided to write the book is because we felt it was a bit like, you know, if you if you arrive at base camp in Everest and you want to go to the summit, um, you don't want a guide who's going to turn up and give you a consultancy report and say, hey, this is how you might want to get to the summit. You know, here's a bit of advice. Um, and then walk away. You want a guide who's going to turn up with the oxygen tanks, with the masks, with the expertise, with somebody who says, and, I, and I've been there before, I know what it looks like. Uh, and um, and I've guided lots of other people. And uh, by the way, I'm going to be with you all the way to the summit. Uh, you know, and, and that's what the market needs. And 
typically the consultancy market is not delivering that. Uh, and um, and what we need is not not um, not a consultancy market that is <clears throat> extracting capability from their clients to make the consultants more powerful. Um, we need we need companies, whether they are call consultancies or or what we call them that can come alongside organizations and build capacity and capability within their clients because they've got to go on the journey. They're the ones that ultimately have got to get to the summit and you've got to get them there. Uh, and, and, and so we wanted to sort of crystallize that thinking, I suppose, within a book, you know, it's the way we operate with our thesis. Uh, and we are, we were thinking, well, how can we deliver more impact out there in the world? beyond what we do in our thesis and we thought this book might do it so so hopefully you know that that message has come across and um and hopefully there's value in in the read absolutely <laughs> and i love the metaphor we we use the same metaphor of getting people to to base camp of scale everest and summiting scale everest uh, where they have led themselves first and foremost to become aware of what's really important and the impact they can possibly make before they seek to lead their team before they seek to lead their organization because if they if they if they challenge themselves to go up there without answering those questions in the first instance they're going to find a huge hollowness by the time they arrive there their team are going to look at them and challenge those leaders as to why they were dragged up there in the first instance and yeah. um and that's not a place we want any of the, the the leaders listening to this to be Stuart, you are an example scaling leader you're you're a father you're a change catalyst what three timeless takeaways can you offer to our listeners today um, uh, take your take your family with you I, I and I say that um, because there are times when I uh, when I know that I've been disconnected and I have, um, luckily I've got a family that, um, is strong enough to, um, to pull me back into that kind of connection. It's so much easier. Uh, and, uh, and actually wonderful if you can take them on the journey with you. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's an overused word, but, but, uh, if ever there was a, a need for courageous, leadership i think it's 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 now uh at this moment in time and we really need to think about the responsibility of the leaders today is different to the responsibility of the leaders 50 years ago it's an extraordinary moment of time uh and and i think that um uh, i'm seeing the emergence of uh and i'm no i'm no expert and i'm not a i'm not researching this and all the rest of it but uh, you know through writing the book through the work that we do I am I am seeing that there is a this new kind of leader that is uh, emerging at this moment in time and it's a leader that uses a lot of humility uh and um and uh and uh insecure leaders often their leadership manifests in control uh and uh and really as we talk about in the book you know there are the leaders that are trying to shore up the strongholds of the old era and they're trying to control the status quo and then there are the more pioneering leaders who are willing to be courageous and willing to be humble and to learn about the fact that actually nobody's been in before uh and they're the ones who are stepping into it and becoming more successful as as we are forced into this transition zone so <clears throat> so i suppose um I suppose they're thinking, you know, take, take your family with you, be courageous and be humble. I love those. And you have delivered an incredible story today with, with huge humility, wonderful energy and uh, inspirational wisdom. I've really enjoyed my time with you. What's what's next for you now? Is there a kind of you've summited now with you know a thousand people? You're making an impact right across the world. Uh, are you guys going to continue to to challenge yourselves to the next summit now that you've arrived at one? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are many summits that we can look at ahead of us, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, but yeah, hey, look, I'm really excited. We've got a we've got our new investment partner being Carlisle. Uh, the opportunity that, that has presented at this moment in time is is just fantastic. You know, we're entering a new phase, a new chapter of the business. It's all about delivering impact, and uh, and we've never had a platform like it, such as you know the market waking up to it. Uh, you know, the arrival of regulation, our new investment partner. And, and so you know it's it's an it's an extraordinary time uh and uh and so yeah for um as i as i have to keep on reminding people uh that um you know i'm uh i'm of an age now where where you know it would be all too easy to start to think about sort of you know sort of um where where's the offer um uh, that I've waited a long time for this moment. Get out of it. You're <laughs> from, a young man. From, from the mid-80s, from the <laughs> mid-80s. To now. I've waited a long time, and so I'm going to make the most of it. Uh, well, look, I wish you every success with that. If people want to hear more about your your work uh, with your co-author, Dean, uh, and Thesis, we're best to connect and reach you, Stuart. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's um, my... Uh, my email is um, uh, stuart.mclaughlin at anthesisgroup.com. Uh, very happy for people to reach out. Uh, and um, uh, and you'll find a, you'll find actually the original title of the book was Canoeing Under Elephants until the publisher convinced us that they, were, they would end up in the travel section rather than the business <laughs> section. And, and so we changed it. But there is a canoeingunderelephant.com uh, website. Uh, where we are, we are trying to bring together some of these kind of stories. Uh, it's it's a bit nascent at the moment, but it will will be quite useful, I think, in terms of um, contacts. Brilliant. Well, look, thanks again uh, for uh, a brilliant conversation today. The time has flown. I've indulged myself by keeping you longer than we planned. Uh, I wish you every success in the future with everything that you're doing, Stuart. Uh, thank you. Take care. Right, pleasure. Thank you, Brendan.